we will put it on we will put it on YouTube on our YouTube channel, which I put the link in the chat already. Um, and be aware that other people will be able to hear you if you unmute yourself and it will end up on the YouTube channel. Maria started the recording and asked questions in the chat box. Um, and we'll have time at the end for questions. Um, we don't have a qu questionnaire, do we today, Maria? No, we don't. Okay. Don't, we are, our funding from ACDD went away. So I guess I could get away from, get rid of that slide. <laughs> um, yeah. So it's, that won't be here anymore. Say goodbye to the, to the um, questionnaires. It's going to be just for your own information. However, we would still would like to get your feedback. Oh, and instead of the questionnaire, we are doing uh, research with Dr. Drew, and you would have a chance to, for a drawing of a gift card, there will be several, several of them, and um, what we are doing is trying to get your opinion on how this training went over the last three years, and um, if you've participated in at least five of our sessions, that puts you right in the running for that. So just email Maria. Did you have anything else to say on that, Maria? I just hope that families will really take the time to participate. It, it is so important that at the end of a uh, you know program, we get some results back and give uh, that information about how was the training, you know, and also uh, what is what our parents learn. And this just helps to promote more education in Alabama. And I hope that you guys will participate. And it also gives us a chance to look for future funding and future grants. So please, we'd like to keep this going one way or another. <laughs> Um, I'm Dr. Doris Hill. I'm the director of the Regional Autism Network, and I'm an associate research faculty member, and um, I'm a board certified behavior analyst and special educator. And now I'm going to hand it over to Maria. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for taking time of your busy schedule. Thank you to our first timers. I see some new people. So thank you for joining us today. And I see a lot of recurring parents. So uh, I appreciate you coming. Uh, my name is Maria Gutierrez and I am the family navigator for the Regional Autism Network. We cover 20 counties and uh, I'm so happy to see families from all over the state. So thank you for being here. And I am so excited to, to pass the microphone to our presenter. This is a very important topic and it's very new in the sense for education for, for parents. And I know that probably professionals are familiar with it, but I was so excited and I've been chasing uh, Jeannie for a long time. And so I'm so grateful that she finally was able to, uh, to coordinate with us. So thank you, Jeannie, and the floor is all yours. Yes, thank you. Well, good morning. It is a pleasure actually to be here. I'm glad we did finally catch up with each other. I do believe we've chased each other for at least more than a year. <laughs> Um, so I am Virginia Young. Uh, some of my peers do call me Jenny. Um, professionally, people know me as Virginia. So if you're looking me up, that's how you'll find me. Um, I'm the clinical director at Peace Center. I am an associate licensed counselor under supervision of Dr. Misty Smith. She is out of the Birmingham area. Um, and I'm almost done. I'm collecting those hours and we've already passed the test. So we're getting very near full licensure at this point. Um, that being said, I just want to throw in a little tiny bit about Peace Center, although I think it will come up later um, in the presentation, but Peace Center is a multi-practitioner, so a multi, um, let's see, what's a different word for practitioner? Professional, multi-discipline is what we call it in the field um, type of place. So it is a therapy center where you can come as a family and you can be served in a number of different kinds of ways. So maybe your child needs occupational therapy. Maybe they need some speech and language um, interventions. Maybe they need uh, a group, 
you know, for them to practice social skills or really just find people that kind of remind them of themselves. Um, also, we have counseling. That is primarily what I do um, with a little bit of functioning kind of coaching that that I get to do as well. Um, so we serve families in a lot of different ways. We are still hiring, actually. So we have some new counselors that will be coming in soon. And we're very excited about uh, what we do here and then just the growth that that we're seeing and how we can provide more and more for the community. So throwing that one out there. So today's topic um, <clears throat> is the whys and the whens of counseling. And I think that is a very valuable topic because um, we all know that everyone has things they can talk about in counseling, but when it's your loved one, when it's your child particularly, or just someone that's outside of your body and you are trying to help manage their lives, um, it can be a little more confusing to know when when they're feeling like maybe they need additional help, maybe just the things that they can learn from a book or from the internet aren't enough. Um, so I think that's an important question just to kind of explore together. It's, it's a little easier for us to know for ourselves when we need um, that additional help. Uh, it's a little harder to navigate that with someone else. So um, the first thing that... I would like to talk about is some vocabulary. So some language that is coming out. You'll see a lot of it on online, on the internet. Um, and it really helps us to have an understanding of what that is. Um, so there is the word neurodiversity. Uh, the word neuro always has to do with the brain and diversity is really just variation. Um, and so our, cons our the way we think about it here at Peace Center is that yes, brains have variety. They are all different um, to, I mean, even twins, you know, identical twins can come up and their brains are still gonna be a bit different. Um, diversity in nature is different. You can have the same type of tree with the same type of leaves, even growing in the same type of soil, but they just won't be the same. And so I think in the PowerPoint, I'm going to bring that up now so you guys can see it because I've got a funny little thing about that. Oh, share my screen. Here we go. Wow. Okay, so the the table of contents says neurodiversity is normal, and that sort of makes me giggle a little bit because um, what even is normal, really? If everything is a little bit different, how do we determine what is considered normal? Um, and so at at Peace Center specifically, we do get a little tickled about normal because if that's defined by you know a certain set of standards, then none of us really kind of would be considered normal. So we, we're all a little different and we like it. So here's the neurodiversity that I was talking about. Neuro means brain, diversity being the way that all things in nature just, they vary. Um, and so at the bottom of it, there is no one size fits all and it's, it's true. Uh, we do try to create things that will help as many people as possible, which is why we have the idea of something being standardized. Um, the idea there is that hopefully, if something is standard, that we can cover more people with that same program, with that same therapy. Yeah. Well, I'm trying to move on to the next thing. There we go. Um, it doesn't want my arrows today. I have to push the buttons. Um, so where we start with neurodiversity, neurodiversity, affirming care. That means we affirm, we um, 
we agree, we even like present it, model it to the community that neuro meaning brain differences are good. They're part of life. It is what it is. We're not broken. We're simply different. Um, and so we have to start here with humility. So Peace Center is still working out its core uh, values, but one of them that we have already established is what we call humility. And it's necessary when you're working with people that have all different types of brains that you come to them with ears that listen um, and a heart that is looking to learn and grow from what they're telling you instead of coming from like for me as a professional, instead of coming to it as well, I've learned all these things, I've done all these trainings and what you're saying doesn't line up with what I understand. Um, the the concept of coming to it with having an open mind to hear new things, to be willing to dig in and learn and research um, is really, really important. And it's part of that neurodiversity affirming care that is out there now. So. So this is our, and this is the wording for our core value that we came up with. And I thought it was really, really good. So I wanted to share it. Um, we remain humble in our efforts, recognizing that we do not have all the answers. Therefore, we are committed to continuous learning from our clients, from their families, from other professionals, and the current research to best serve our community. So basically, we can learn from anyone and anything. And uh, we are bright enough as human beings to kind of make discernment as we are learning different things in today's world. You can learn a lot of things from the internet, but that doesn't mean it's all true. And I think that's important. Um, and that's why we, like in our core values, we've listed several um, places where we might gain information that would be important uh, to serving and just understanding, so. Uh, agency. This is another of the concepts that we want to discuss in neurodiversity affirming. Um, part of that, that conceptual idea behind um, managing and, and working with clients is what we call agency. And this can come with a lot of different words. We don't have to call it agency, but it is good to learn that vocabulary. Um, that it's out there so that when it does appear, you kind of have an understanding of what that means when you're talking about persons, personhood. Um, so before I get into the research, we might use, uh, instead of using the word agency, we might use um, self-determination. We might use the word autonomy or choice, giving that person their choices. Uh, Sometimes we use voice, like we'll say they'll use their voice in the situation and they don't necessarily mean they're making noise from their throat or their mouth. They mean they are telling you how they're feeling and why it's important to them and to what degree um, that can be seen as agency as well. Uh, uh, sometimes they'll say power. You, you got your power back. You've probably heard somebody say that. Um, that's what this means. You're able to make choices for your own life or they are able to make choices for their own life. So um, agency is also one of our core values here. Uh, research shows that a sense of agency, a sense of having a control, some level of control over the choices you can make for yourself is very important part of, st of a strong sense of identity actually. And um, in order to have that, Strong having that strong sense of identity allows you to have this foundation for learning and just general well-being. And we know that well-being is such a encompassing term. Um, it can mean so many things, and it actually does mean lots of things all at the same time, right? Like wellness. The concept of wellness isn't just about your physical health. Um, it's it's also about your mental health, your emotional health, your social health, even your spiritual health, all of those things together make wellness, right? And so well-being is the same. You might have um, 
a loved one who, you know, maybe right now their health is, is doing pretty well. Um, but they still may appear to be uh, irritated or cry a lot or um, seem to always be on alert looking for possibly danger or something along those lines, something that might go wrong. That would, I would not say they were feeling well in that moment. Their well-being is maybe needing to be addressed something else is occurring in their life and that's worth exploring. Um, and so that link down at the bottom really just goes with that um, research really, just to say, I didn't make this up. It's not just me who feels this way. <laughs> All right, so agency as we describe it is a sense of control over your choices and the outcome of your choices. Now, as human beings, we all know that we can make all the best choices that we think are correct or right or whatever for our situation and the outcome isn't always what we thought it would be. Um, but having no choices and receiving an outcome is completely different. It, it, it allows everything to feel out of your control, which is why it's important that people do have some level of choice in their life. And this gets a little tricky um, because oh, I work a lot with children and adolescents. Um, and this can get tricky with children and adolescents because we know that certain choices, it's really not best that they make those if they're not ready, if their mind isn't equipped to be able to make those kinds of choices well. Like if I allow my child, my 15 year old to decide when he wants to go to sleep, it might not go well because he doesn't, he has a, you know, a consistency in his choices of, he wants to do the fun over doing what will be best. And so he's not ready for those types of choices, but there are choices he can make we can say, okay, you have to go to bed between nine and 10. At what point would you like to begin getting ready? So you're still giving them a certain level of agency over their life. Um, and I do feel that's really important at Peace Center. It is one of our uh, core values because children particularly, and I would venture to say also disabled individuals often have less choice than what they're observing around them. So you you hear children say, well, you do X, Y, Z, you know, will you do that? Well, why can't I do that? Because you do that. And so they do make that observation of like, they're not allowed to do all those things. And that's okay. There are reasons for that. Um, but it becomes an issue where they're, uh, they feel they become overwhelmed with the feeling of like, well, I have no choice. So it doesn't even matter. I just, I just give up because it doesn't matter. <laughs> like, I'll just do whatever because I'm gonna get in trouble if I don't, you know? So in our office, especially, it's um, important for the emotional part of it that we give them whatever level of choice that we can. So, it, and just as a play therapist, this is actually part of what we do in play therapy is that 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 session is theirs. That is their hour. That's their 45 minutes. I only have two rules. It's don't hurt Miss Virginia and try not to break my things. If you need to throw Play-Doh in this office because your day was that overwhelming, let me put my hard hat on, you know? So um, we do try to give children a safe, space where they can explore making some choices for themselves even if they're kind of ridiculous even if they might hit their own self in the head with that stick they're swinging around you know um so a lack of agency can be experienced like oppression it's it's as if things are happening to them instead of them having any power to change and this can create a lot of different things actually um it can create shutdown it can create anxiety because you're out of control. If you have no control, you feel very out of control. Um, it can create depression because you do get a sense of hopelessness, helplessness. Well, what, what difference does it make? I, nobody listens to me anyway, you know? Um, and then a lot of volatile behaviors because honestly, no one likes to feel like they have no power. Um, 
literally no one. And so sometimes what you're looking at when I, when someone is reacting or becoming volatile or, you know, banging their head or biting or whatever it is, they feel helpless. And this is the only way to express this is I, I need in this moment to have some level of power. Um, so sometimes that's what you're looking at when you see those kinds of behaviors. So all of that was kind of neurodiversity affirming care. It's going to create, it's going to allow that person to have a lot of choice. Um, and then it's going to create for the people that are working with them to be humble, to listen well, and to uh, really put it back out there to them that they feel hurt. How can I, how can I show them that I really do hear them? Even if I can't necessarily fix what they're saying or do what they want, how can I show them that I still understand that feeling they're having? Um, and so that's when we get into this when and why of counseling. So how do you know? How do you know when your loved one needs counseling? Well, partly look at yourself. Like, how do you know you need counseling? And then kind of observe what, what you're seeing from there outside and imagine what are some reasons that they may be doing this, this, or this. So I just misspelled symptoms, but um, depression symptoms, we'll get to that because I will have a slide for these things, but social and emotional things, Social and emotional meaning, maybe they they come home and they say, oh, well, I don't really have any friends or um, my friends were making fun of me today or um, what's another one? Maybe they had a friend and now they're having a fight, but you've seen this pattern several times. Um, there could be lots of different kinds of social things. Maybe every time mom comes in the room that child's behavior changes dramatically. Um, that happens kind of a lot. Or every time they come home from school, they kind of blow up or shut down. You know, there's a large observable uh, reaction. Uh, internal dialogue. So internal dialogue is really just the things you say to yourself in your head. And some people say a lot of it out loud, but there are plenty of us that say it in our head. And maybe we don't even notice it half the time. You know, maybe we don't notice that I said out loud, oh, look, I misspelled the word symptoms. You know, I don't mind because I, I understand that that's just a, a little thing. But maybe you're the kind of person who walks around and thinks about, oh, I shouldn't have done this. I wish I'd done that differently. The internal dialogue for a loved one can tell you a lot about their emotional state. So um, I am not just a, a counselor. I do also, I'm a mother in this special needs land. I have three autistic children and an additional child that only has ADHD so far. <laughs> so I understand a lot of the parenting struggle as well. And I too experience ADHD. So I think that really helps, but it's, I can, I can use some examples from like my own home. So internal dialogue is something that my son struggles with. And so I can tell when he is like needing a, a therapy appointment with his counselor, when he starts to shift his language and he'll say, well, I can't do anything right. Well, it doesn't matter because he's just going to you know, tell me that I didn't, you know, I didn't do it right, or it's too late. You can't count that assignment. It doesn't matter. When he starts to kind of get, have the sound of giving up, right? Like whatever. Plus he's 15. And I think 15 year olds sometimes are just like that. Um, but it's really good to look for things like self-deprecation. So putting yourself down, calling yourself names, uh, getting annoyed. We all do funny like some of us do I won't say we all do some of us do make jokes about ourselves that because we think it's like we're kind of funny we're kind of amusing and being human is kind of funny and kind of amusing um but you if you're spending time with your loved one you know when the tone of what they're saying shifts 
And so it's not really funny anymore. Now it feels a little intense. Maybe it feels a little um, bitter, <laughs> like a little angry, I guess. It has an, I call it, it has an edge to it is because if words had feelings, you know, physical feelings, I would say it has an edge to it. So, um, and then just additional symptoms, which we'll get into. Some of them are physical. I'm going to leave this one up for a minute because that is a lot of information. Um, but depression can look differently in kids. It can look differently really across the board because diversity, right? Like we all experience things in a different way. Um, but I think for children, especially one thing that gets overlooked is the irritability and the restlessness. You don't often go like, oh, that, that kid may be depressed because they're irritable. You just think maybe they're being annoying or they didn't get enough rest or, and those might be true too, actually. So we've got irritability, sadness, crying. Um, again, some of these things will be normal or typical for your loved one. What you're really looking for is a change. You're looking for a change in the, the amount. How often are they crying? What are they crying about? Um, if these things are changing from what you're used to, it, it's probably a good idea to reach out to someone just to check in even. Um, so you're looking for hopelessness or a feeling of emptiness, low, low energy. Um, no longer enjoying the things that they once did. I feel like that that's sometimes overlooked as well. Uh, but that's actually a really good indicator. Things that they loved that would always spark their joy. It's just okay now. Like, yeah, okay, I like that thing, I guess. Um, you probably want to check in on their internal, the ins, their emotional world, the things that they're thinking, the things that they're saying, and the way that that makes them feel. Um, change in sleeping or eating patterns. Again, this can be tricky with certain um, diagnoses. We know that sleeping patterns are kind of irregular sometimes with ADHD or autism, eating patterns for lots of different kinds of disabilities. Um, but again, we're looking for a significant difference, a significant change. Um, isolating, this is actually a pretty, pretty decent indicator. Um, even for those of us that are like maybe more introverted anyway, uh, our world can get very, very small. And as a counselor, it's a lot, it's a lot more difficult to open that world back up again once they've chosen to, to make their world small. And I'll kind of explain that because that may be too figurative. Um, I think the experience of the pandemic and COVID did this for a lot of people. And I do think that we see that I'm seeing in my office, um, kind of, a that struggle come to life is trying to reopen your life to feel comfortable, to feel safe, adding other interactions with humans, adding, um, in-person things as opposed to online things. It's, it's a lot harder once they've decided to make their world small in order to feel safe. Does that make sense? Okay, and we can ask questions about that in a minute. Um, change in hygiene management. So if you have a family member that is able to care for their own hygiene, and then you start to notice that it's it's kind of like, oh, we're not we're not really brushing our teeth every day anymore. Uh, we're definitely not bathing as often, like it, and it's going down. We want to find out why. Like it could be a health reason, it could be sensory reason. Um, but a lot of times if we're experiencing some pretty extreme anxiety or depression and several other things, um, you'll see a shift in the hygiene, and that's that's a pretty good indicator because that's actually you've probably been, they've probably been dealing with it longer than you realized at that point. And then of course you have physical, physical issues, physical aches and pains. Um, you get, we get headaches, we get stomach aches. These all can be just sort of an expression of your body trying to tell you something is not right. And that thing sometimes is emotional. 
So then we get into social emotional. Loneliness is a really, really big one. If your child uses the word lonely or says, I feel alone. And I, and I do apologize if I keep saying child, but this is, you know, this is kind of the world that I, that I'm often working in. Um, that that's really important to listen to because that's, that rarely has anything to do with how many social activities they have. It's really more of a, a deep feeling of like hopelessness. They're, they're longing for connection. And even if they're surrounded by people, they don't sense the connection that they feel they need. Um, so trouble making or keeping friends, getting in trouble in school. Again, I sh we're looking for a change. If you have a kid that gets in trouble a lot anyway at school, then let's not worry too much. Although there's a lot we can do about that here in, in our office. Um, we get a lot of what we would call behavior challenges. Um, or, if, or if your family or your loved one is going through just a difficult life transition, divorce, um, moving, uh, adding a new person into the home, losing a friend, losing a loved one, experiencing, like just experiencing, like being a part of uh, observing large things like a wreck or um, even what's going on in the world today. If they're, if they're exposed enough to the news, um, these things can have really much larger effects on them than you might imagine. And then bullying is so much bigger. And I'd put by peers and adults because there are times, especially with, um, especially with disability, that even children are bullied by adults. And I would say, I my hope is that it is uh unintentional i'll just leave it at that i could probably give a whole talk on this um <laughs> but my hope is that if if a child is being you know what they feel like uh singled out or targeted in a way um by a, an adult because of maybe their disability or some symptom of their disability behaviors etc um this can have a huge impact on their self-esteem. And so that is something you really want to have support in. And partly just so that they have not just mom and dad, right? Or not just aunt or grandma or whoever you are in their life, but that they have an additional adult in their life that cares about them, that is listening to them, and that is giving them back a little bit of their here's that word, agency, a little bit back of their ability to make the choices that they feel give them a sense of control. Um, and then we did talk about internal dialogue a little bit. I did not mean to turn that so quickly. There you go. So we're just, again, we're looking for a change. And when you look in the manual to diagnose people, the manual I use is, is specifically more for like mental disorders, developmental disorders. Almost all of them say a significant impact, a significant change on your functioning in whatever areas of your life. Uh, so that's what we're really looking for. If they're making a lot of negative statements about others, that's probably an indicator of how they are also talking to themselves on the inside. That's really important. Um, suicidality, this is a word meaning you are having a lot of thoughts about suicide. Doesn't always mean you're going to, you know, or planning to commit suicide, but it definitely needs to be addressed. Um, it needs to be validated is the word. So you're going to respond to that individual to let them know that you hear them, that you're here for them, and that you're going to help them make next steps, whatever they are. Um, definitely want to seek out a professional in those situations. You just, it's not the kind of judgment call that you want to make alone. Um, intrusive thoughts, I'm throwing that out there because we actually do see a lot of um, clients that have either tick disorders or OCD. And those often come 
And they're not the only thing that comes with, but they often come with intrusive thoughts. And intrusive thoughts can be a wide variety of things. Uh, but the ones we often see that become disturbing in a way will be something completely different than how the child thinks or completely different than things that they would feel are appropriate or right. And so when they have that thought, whatever it is, um, it disturbs them so much because it's completely anti the opposite of how they are. And that being disturbed about that thought, being worried and scared about having had this thought is what keeps it replaying in their head. Those kinds of things are best addressed with a professional. Um, there's a bit of normalizing you can do. So just letting them know that, hey, this isn't probably as weird or strange or odd as you might feel like it is. And hearing that from a professional sometimes kind of gives them this, oh, like, it's not just me. Okay. <laughs> okay. I thought I was kind of losing my mind, you know? Um, so then, then I just added a few extras, reassurance seeking. Someone who asks the same question over and over, well, well, how do I know? Well, are you sure? Uh, Mom, did you pack my lunch? Mom, did you pack my, are you sure you packed my lunch? Hey, remind me again, did you get my lunch? You know, at some point you're going, okay, there's more to this than whether or not he wants to know if I packed his lunch. And that's at least worth exploring. It may be literally nothing. It might just be, you know, repetition. We're, I'm repeating this because this is the phrase I know. Um, but it is worth checking because it can be a, any number of things. And then extreme inflexibility. So we know that a lot of clients with developmental disabilities or whatever that come in here have um, have things, that's me, forgot to turn that off, um, have things that create that inflexible behavior, I guess, reaction to a lot of things. And so what we're looking for, again, I'm going to keep saying this because this is the main thing is that you're looking for a change, like an alteration, like, like for my son specifically, he can be extremely inflexible, but in certain circumstances, if he's really struggling, he's going to be that much more rigid. Um, and so that's worth, again, just check in with, uh, check in with the counselor, check in with any of your team members, honestly. Okay, what is your role connection? Oh, I mean, I'm a counselor, what can I say? It's going to be the first thing on my list always because you can't assist them in the next steps unless they feel safe with you and they feel heard. So connection, connection, connection. If you take nothing else, start there from this. Um, and then curiosity. And I love this word, especially when you're dealing with kids. That kind of goes back to the the idea of not knowing everything. Be curious. Wow, I wonder what it is instead of why, but like, I wonder what it is that has you feeling like this. You know, I wonder why your friend would have responded that way. And just, you're asking the question, but you're not answering it. You're letting them do the answering. Um, you'd be amazed what kids will tell you if you leave it open for them. Uh, and then understanding, I was going to use the word empathy, but that one's not always straightforward, but understanding sometimes I actually heard Mr. Rogers say this, that someone, you know, posted a link to, to something he had said. And it said that, you know, the main problem with grownups is that they have forgotten what it was like to be a child. And I thought, yeah, <laughs> I mean, it's because we have all these grown up things to do and experience, but uh, when you're working with a child, it's really important to just step into their head for a minute, to step into their shoes and just go like, gosh, if I were six years old and all I wanted to do was say, you know, hi to my friend in the hallway. And now I've got, I've gotten in trouble. Like what, how would I feel? You know, yes, I was doing the wrong thing, but, but as a child, you might not imagine it that way. Um, oh, and then that's agency, which just 
We've already been over that. I misspelled that one too. Um, and then modeling advocacy. So the reason I put to model advocacy is because what we want to do, we want to be an advocate for our person, but we also want to show them how to do it well. Um, and I know we've all been there, like as a parent and an advocate for my child, I have definitely been there where I want to just, you know, say all the words and rip your head off, you know, <laughs> because it's unjust and it's, it's good to feel anger about injustice, but we want to model for them a way that they can advocate, that ask the question, to speak their need in a way that can at least has the chance to be received, you know, especially for kids. I, I'm just putting myself in the classroom in my head right now, but especially in the classroom, we, I want my, my clients that come in here, I want them to be able to speak what they need to speak in a way that can be heard. Same for my kids. I want you to be able to say, I don't think I can do this right now. I'm feeling really overwhelmed. And I'm not going to promise that the grown up in their space is going to respond to that well. Um, but I want to model that for them. And so that's kind of our role is to model that. And then also as they grow, as they, as they become a little more skilled, they will naturally advocate for themselves because of the modeling. Um, and then, you know, just like you would teach social skills, then you just tweak those things that they have learned. Let's just tweak that a little bit. Um, and then last community, this is huge and difficult. Without a doubt, I fully understand that, that this space of living with disabilities, it can be a real challenge to feel like you have gathered adults around you, your family, your people. Um, it can be very isolating. It really can. I literally personally made a Facebook post yesterday about disability, spe specifically like what appears to be an invisible disability, things people don't notice easily um, and how it's just beyond explanation. And, you know, in that moment of making that, I felt very isolated and kind of alone. And then, you know, this morning I can look back and see that like, you know, 20 people commented and I realized all of them are kind of have had this experience. And so we aren't alone. It's really important for us to create community, especially adults around our kids, our teens, our loved ones. They need to know it's not just my mom or my relative that likes me because they have to. No, like I'm okay in this world as I am. So I think that's really important. Um, when, okay, counselor is gonna say it right out. Just put it out there. Please don't wait. Don't wait until it is so entirely unmanageable because at that point, the road back is so much harder um, because usually when your loved one is has experienced so much of a what feels like a personality change you know a phys maybe they're having physical symptoms all of this has to basically be undone and the reality is once you've reached that level they've been having these internal experiences for a lot longer than you think so Notice those signs, give it, like I put on here, two to six weeks, max. <laughs> Some of the criteria in, in the manual says, have you been crying, you know, most days or every day for two weeks? Well, I also know that there are some two week periods in the lives of disabled individuals that are just going to be that hard. Um, so trust your intuition. I think that was literally next, trust your intuition. Uh, I think we get away from doing that. I think we have questioned our own ability to make these solid judgments so long, um, but time and time again, trust your intuition. If you, if you, oh, that's my mess. <laughs> I have to use my tools too. Um, yeah, trust your intuition. If you have a sense that this doesn't feel right, Maybe you want to wait, just don't wait that long. Don't wait that long. And then 
back to that sense of agency, keep that loved one in the conversation. Let them do as much of the choice making as they can. And I want to add something that I didn't really put in here, but not every um, professional that works with your kid is going to be best fit. And you want to go ahead and say that, or, or your loved one, it's not always children, but you want to say that while you're in the process of, of making appointments and sorting it out. You want them to have that expectation like, hey, this might not work. We're going to give it a try. But that doesn't mean that therapy doesn't work because this professional wasn't a good fit for me. Go, go find someone else, dig around. So I'm going to bypass this page because I can throw it in later. Um, do you share the PowerPoint? Okay, good. Because you guys can screen, well, whatever you call it. <laughs> Take a picture of this. QR code. Um, this is our team at Peace Center. And the reason I threw that in there is because, again, we do different things. And I love that we do different things because we see so many more of the holes or the overlap. I, I, I have had a kid that also works with occupational therapy. And I just kind of made the observation, you know, most of what I'm also doing in my session is sensory integration work. And that's not really my specialty. I'm familiar enough with it to, to recognize it, but it may be better for this kid right now just to see that OT every week. Because if he can get a handle on some of the sensory things, he might not have so many emotional things. All right, so I'm gonna write on how to find, and I put this funny little thing, lumping versus splitting, lumping, is when you just lump all the behaviors and the symptoms and the things you're suspicious might be something into one category. Oh, this is, you know, this is just the autism. Okay, maybe, possible. I'm a splitter. <laughs> I was trained to be one. Um, I did my internship out of Atlanta with a, a group called Park Care Consultants. And that is how she trained me. She said, you've got to find the individual struggles so you can address those. But there is an order to it. So at Peace Center, we will always ask you about your sleep first because sleep is the foundation of health in general. If you're not sleeping, how do I know if you have sensory integration issues? Like I would be having a meltdown too if I had had three hours of sleep. Um, so that I put that in there to say, what is the need? is the need specific to speech and communication, then look for that speech therapist, right? Um, is the need like emotional outbursts because of the divorce we're going through? That's a counselor issue, right? Um, so there's just dig down and kind of figure out what am I looking to, to address? What What is the need? Um, Ask your primary care doctor. I always start here. They might not know, but a lot of them have a lot of good resources and they can say, well, I start with this or this or this. And so then at that point, you've got, you know, 50 professionals narrowed down to three, which is really helpful. If you, if it's an insurance issue, always call the insurance, please always call the insurance. Um, there's just no guarantee unless you do that little bit of legwork first. Uh, ask other parents, loved ones in those groups. I, there's so much available online now. Um, but in addition to that, I won't just say the online groups. I'll say it, like if my kid is dealing with OCD, I'm going to go to the professional International OCD Foundation website and see who they have listed as their practitioners. Um, if the kid, like I have Tourette in my household, I might go to the Tourette website, Tourette Association of America. So look for that professional um, group as well. Not just the moms, although those are great. Again, trust your intuition and don't be afraid to ask. This was important to me. Don't be afraid to ask that, uh, that group, that practitioner for flexibility in their payments or in like 
I have recently switched after school to 45 minute sessions instead of an hour. I do that for two reasons. Kids are exhausted after school. The last thing they want to do is sit in my office for an hour. <laughs> Second, not everybody can afford a full hour's worth. And if your kid only really needs 45 minutes, then I only want to charge you for 45 minutes, you know? And so that makes it all the more accessible to anyone. So don't be afraid to ask. A lot of people do have a sliding scale or do have some options. And then the last thing on here is psychology today. It, I, this helps me none at all to tell you about it, but it's so practical. It's a list. It's a list of psychologists and social workers and counselors, you know, and it's got um, methods for you to be able to whittle down, like, what do I need? I need this insurance for this age group and these are my issues. So it's psychologytoday.com, really basic. It has a search, so. Okay, I think I have made it through all of my, yes, I did. So thank you. <laughs> thank now, you, Angie. Okay. That was awesome. And um, I sent you all the questions as they were coming through. Oh so you should be able to see them if you wanna, if you go ahead and go on the chat box. Oh yeah, let me make it bigger. There we go. Um, Can you guys still see me? Okay. Oh, so this is a vocabulary kind of question, a terminology question. Um, is the term neurodiversity to be applied for individuals and mental conditions like anxiety and OCD? Um, absolutely, I would say. It's, it's literally just that your brain works a bit different. There is, of course, conversation out there about whether we call this a difference or a disorder. And I think that's gonna be very personal. Um, to me, OCD can quite often appear very disordered. Uh, and I think it can be experienced that way. It, it seems from the outside to be experienced very disordered. And so is there a sense that we will uh, you know, do types of therapy to uh, correct it, watch my air quotes, to, what we're looking for is not to fix someone or that they, or to say that their brain is broken, but simply to find out what are their goals and let's accomplish those. So if their goal is, I don't wanna wash my hands seven times, then we're going to do some OCD work so that we don't have to do that. Oh, this is great. I've been learning more about allowing my child who has severe intellectual disability and is nonverbal to give him his freedom of choice. And I can say that he's happier now. Yes, I, I love that. I can't really tell, you know, stories from the office, but I definitely have seen that in the, like I have some older, you know, early twenties um, disabled individuals that come in with their families and I've seen it too. Can young children be evaluated for depression? Absolutely. Um, who can I reach out to? Uh, for the sake of finances, I would say start with your primary care physician. Some of them actually will uh, assess them. And if not, they'll send you to a counselor. And, and I do assess uh, for depression. Um... How do I distinguish between what is considered normal behavior? Oh, and when I, as a parent, might seek professional help. So that is the ongoing question of parenting a uh, tricky child. Um, one that kind of appears to be, you know, out of the ordinary anyway. How do I know? So what you're looking for, if I said it once, I said it 20 times, it is a significant change. Um, so maybe you have a kid that gets overwhelmed from school and they often will go and hide. But now, now we're crying and we're melting down and we're refusing dinner and it, it will build just 
as soon as you notice that this is out of the ordinary, don't wait much longer. Like again, two to six weeks, don't wait too long because it only grows. Um, when looking for help professionally, who helps? A therapist, a psychologist, just, or a counselor? Oh, the difference is, this is a fantastic question. Um, and I'll add in a psychiatrist. A psychiatrist is a doctor, a medical doctor. He or she will um, can diagnose, but often they'll send you to a psychologist to diagnose. Mostly they simply work with whatever diagnosis you have and medication. Um, I hear that some psychiatrists will actually listen and allow you to talk for a long period of time. That's pretty um, abnormal and often pretty pretty costly. Um, a therapist, so a therapist, I will use the word counselor and therapist interchangeably, uh, meaning to represent the same thing. Um, but a therapist can also be, you know, an occupational therapist or a speech and language therapist. So I guess that word is a little tricky. Um, a counselor is going to do more um, emotional based things, uh, talk therapy or play play therapy. I guess that's a little confusing, isn't it? And then a psychologist. Psychologists can also do counseling and they do. But if you want large assessments, if you like, if I'm going to take my kid to have multiple assessments done, I apologize for that. Um, then I'm sending them to a psychologist. So they, a psychologist will have their doctorate. Um, their PhD, and they will more than, if they're from Auburn, they will have it in research. Um, and so their assessments are going to be, you know, they have done a lot more work in those assessments. I do assessments, but it's going to be on a much, much simpler. I can do a, a basic, you know, depression assessment. I, I do assess for autism in, in teens and adults, but that is because i went and got additional training in that specifically because there's a hole um, for that. In, a, in not just in our community, just kind of across the board. Um, can you give an example of what emptiness means and looks like? My child is a tween and I want to learn more. And tween is hard because they do start to shift out of that uh, playful um, space and they will, there's a certain level of, of typicalness to that, what I call introspection. So turning their focus and their thoughts inwards and going, well, well, what am I like compared to this? And is that okay? They, because of their brain development, it's where they are in their brain development. So that like 11, 12 is, is a sweet spot for really seeing your kid kind of almost close off. I like to call it like cocoon or turtle. Um, and you really want to find a way to draw them out, but your old methods won't work anymore. Um, you're going to, I always tell people, this is when you start doing driving, like, do something that's side by side, because if you're looking at them, they're going to talk less. That's my little therapeutic tip. Um, is there a way for parents to check into professional credentials to see their expertise? How do I ask without looking specific, but ah, suspicious? Um, and there's several more that I won't get to, but um, for heaven's sake, look suspicious. <laughs> That's what I have to say about that. Please look suspicious because um because why not? Because it's that important. You know, you don't, you really don't want to just send your kid to some random, what maybe is labeled a counselor from, I won't give any specifics, but like, you don't want to just randomly send them to someone and you don't know what their specialties are. So yes, you can look, um, use that internet, man. <laughs> use the internet. Like for me, if I'm going to present, if I'm going to put out any, um, uh, anything in text, then I have to put, I am an ALC because that means associate. Uh, I am under this person's supervision. It is an absolutely an ethical requirement. Um, so that shouldn't be a hidden thing. If you can't find it easily, 
don't feel bad about asking, just ask. That would be my last question. I think that's the end. We're wrapping up. I actually do have a client after this. Okay. I think that there was uh, one more. Uh, should counseling sessions be how far apart? Once a week, twice a week, or once a month? What is your opinion? That is a fantastic question, and it will be an opinion. Um, I actually have a very specific way that I do that. Um, when I'm first seeing a client, I want to see them at least four times, four times, so four weeks, once a week, four times in a row. And that is really to establish the connection or to make it really clear that like this maybe isn't the right connection. Um, just to create that safety and that relationship because the way that counseling often works, it very much depends on the relationship. If a kid comes to me and they think I'm their parent or their teacher, this is a bad sign. They will tell me nothing. <laughs> they will tell me nothing. So um, I have to speak their language and be kind of silly with them and really pay attention to how they operate. Um, so I like to see them four times in a row weekly. And then if they're not in some level of crisis, right? If they're not having, you know, big explosions or violence each week, then I will push them to every other week. And that is partly because I want to be accessible to more people and partly because I think that for many, that is enough. Um, if that's a concern, of course, I'll see them weekly. Like, no big deal. Great. Good for me. Once a month is really, that's what I call, like, we are on our transitioning into freedom. Fly away, birdie. Um, so if I've gotten to the point where I'm seeing somebody once a month, it's because really they're not feeling fully confident to go out and do it entirely on their own. But it really only takes, you know, a few times if they're really ready. Maybe they'll come see me one month and then another month. And then they're like, okay, I think I've got this. Um, just on a personal level, me, I see my therapist once a month. And I refuse to let her go because, <laughs> because I know that once a month, something will definitely have need to be discussed. So it's not a perfect plan, but that's kind of how I operate. And the other question is, what is your opinion about school-based counseling? What is it better? What is it better in school or outside the school, considering the student is a teen? Yeah, uh, two things. If they have a solid relationship with that person, then it's going to be valuable. That being said, school counseling is different. Uh, school counseling and clinical health, mental health counseling run the same track for about a year and then they kind of split off. School counseling is shorter um, because they're required to do a lot of other things besides just, you know, therapy based things. So they might do classes on uh, like one of my kids came home and said, oh, we had a counseling class on drugs or candy, you know, and I thought, Okay. I mean, that's necessary, but I didn't know how that related to counseling necessarily. So school, they now have a mental health counselor um, that services, it's like one is available that services many schools. This is new within maybe the last year. Um, I would see that as pretty valuable. Also, I, I'm not entirely sure how accessible that is. Um, you know, if you've got thousands and thousands of, of students and then you have this one mental health counselor, like, I, I love that it's there. I think it, they're, they're paying attention and I love that. But I'm not entirely sure if that's enough. So. Okay. And the last question that just came out is, when working with families of different backgrounds and different beliefs, what is the best way to share the importance of, of self-determination? That's a beautiful question. Man, I get that. Um, a really trained counselor 
is going to focus in on what are your goals and what are your beliefs. I will, I have my own faith, my own beliefs, and none of that comes into the counseling space unless that client is, says, I want to talk about blah, blah, blah. Um, so, and that, that is how it should be. That is according to our ethical board, even that is, so if somebody isn't counseling in that way, you might want to double check their credentials. They might, they may just be credentialed differently. Um, I would lean heavily into whatever that client and their family's beliefs are. If I don't have an understanding, I will tell them, I don't have an understanding of this, but I would like to walk this with you. What do I need to know? And then do a little research of our own because we do that. If we have something that we feel like we can kind of manage and walk with, but also we don't have all the information, we go get it. I don't see any other questions, but I just want to let everybody know that uh, I put um, on the chat box the link for psychology today and also for the YouTube channel for the HTRAN, where this presentation will be uploaded later on and whoever registered and is attending today will get a copy of the handout. So, uh, Jean Jeannie, is there anything that you would like to close with? And people are very appreciative of your time. And they said, great presentation. This presentation was awesome. And they really thank you for your time. Dr. Hill, is there anything that you would like to add? And then we give the floor to Jeannie. I just wanted to say thank you, Ms. Young, for coming today. And welcome to Auburn. Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, I wanted to thank, of course, our, our uh, interpreters. Uh, Ms. Iris and Mr. Yancey, we really appreciate your expertise um, in providing good interpretation services. Go ahead. Okay, so uh, Jeannie, I want you to close today's presentation with something for our families and our professionals, because this is so important to seek help when we think it is needed. So final words. Final words, uh, I'm going to go back to connection. Keep that connection. I know you get tired. Man, do I know. <laughs> Very, we're being beat up on all sides sometimes because we are, parenting is hard, but parenting outside of what would be considered typical is just a whole different ball game. And I get it. So do what you need to do to refresh yourself in order to be available to really study your person, to be able to study, to go, oh, this is different. I I have paid enough attention to know they need some help or we as a family maybe need some support um, and don't wait too long. <laughs> well, thank you so very much. I hope that parents and professionals found it very, very important as I did, okay? And uh, be on the lookout for the next program for next month. We are trying to uh, to be out and about. You know, we might be started doing things quarterly. So just be keeping an eye on the emails that we send. And thank you again for coming and attending today. Yes, Dr. Hill. Oh, I just wanted to say, I'm not sure I articulated it as well as I could have. But understand that if you participate in our research, there is the chance of a drawing, probably a gift card. And the importance of participating helps us move forward and perhaps pursue additional funding other places for this. I'm done. Thank you. So thank you, everybody. Thank you again, Jeannie. And thank you to our professionals and to our parents. Have a wonderful rest of your day.